Good morning and welcome in the name of our Lord Jesus to our worship at uh, St. Jacob this morning. We'll be using the service of the word uh, and uh, some of the important parts to follow along are printed in the bulletin for today. We'll have our opening here.
reveal your mighty power chiefly in showing mercy and kindness. Grant us the full measure of your grace that we may obtain your promises and become partakers of your heavenly glory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
continuing our readings uh, through that epistle. And we're in the second half of the epistle, which centers on our sanctification and life for God. So I tell you this and testify it to it in the Lord. Do not walk any longer as the Gentiles walk in their futile way of thinking. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their hearts. Because they have no sense of shame, they have given themselves over to sensuality with an ever-increasing desire to practice every kind of impurity. <clears throat> but you did not learn Christ in that way, if indeed you have heard of him and were taught in him, since the truth is in Jesus. As far as your former way of life is concerned, you were taught to take off the old self, which is corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be renewed continually in the spirit of your mind, and to put on the new self, which has been created to be like God in righteousness and true holiness. This is the word of God. Alleluia. Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Alleluia. for the 
into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And we'll pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dear fellow redeemed, unity is a very prized goal in Christianity and in the world. Um, look how much we hear about how good it would be if our country were united. Look how many people, listen to how many people you hear say, what a wonderful world it would be if the world were united. And of course, we Christians say, what a wonderful testimony we could make for our Lord Jesus if Christians were united. What a wonderful congregation we could have if we as all members were perfectly united. It's a great goal, one to aspire to, and that's what the Apostle Paul talks about uh, in our text for this morning. Uh, as I mentioned when I introduced the epistle reading, uh, the epistle breaks down into two parts, and the first part chapters 1, 2, and 3 talk clearly about God's grace, the wonderful things He has done for us, um, what He has made us, um, what He's done for us by His grace. And I can't help but think of chapter 1, where we have the doctrine of predestination. Before the world was created, God knew you, He knew each of us and the life of grace and faith that, that he wanted to give to us. What a wonderful blessing. Um, how out of our hands that blessing is. Because God had a plan uh, from eternity. And then we get to chapter 2, um, that, where we have those famous verses, For it is by grace you have been saved. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Uh, it was out of God's undeserved love, His compassion, and His powerful activity toward us that saved us as sinners from the just consequences of our sin and made us His own. We can't brag. When I read through the epistle to the Ephesians, I'm often wondering what the relationship between uh, the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians were. It, it, there had to be some difficulties between those two groups, and Paul obviously addresses both of them. Now, when he said, it is by grace and not by works in those verses we just heard. I can't help but think that he's talking to the Jewish Christians. Because with the Old Testament laws, it could so easily slip into thinking that if we obey those laws given through Moses at Mount Sinai, we are the people of God and God is happy with us. And uh, that is work righteousness. And that is what Paul is condemning. And here, I believe, since he said, now, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. I wonder if he's talking more to the Jewish Christians, the Gentile Christians, who once were not uh, at all a part of the people of God, but now were brought near by the kindness of God to, toward them in the gospel. And there really was the possibility for some harsh feelings between these two groups. Well, in part because the covenant given on Mount Sinai through Moses was intended to keep Israel as God's people and separate from the rest of the unbelieving world. 
And, and you know that God's rules regulating the clothes that they wore, the food that they ate, um, their activity of worshiping God, you know, the sacrifices and, and the um, festivals that they kept. Uh, it, it really did set them apart to assure us that there is such a thing as being set apart for God and there is such a thing as being the people of God. Also saying God is present in this world supporting his people. All those things were taught through uh, the Old Testament Israel. But it could rub people the wrong way by uh, just, no, you can't come into our house. If I go into your house, I'm unclean, the Jews would have to say to their Gentile neighbors. And uh, wouldn't that put you off a little bit? Um, and so the staying separate and uh, being so um, determined in your separateness could put off the Gentiles. It, it just had to be irritating both ways. Right? The Jews were irritated by the freedom and the former life of sin that the Gentiles were engaged in, and the Gentile believers had to be continually irritated by some of the continuing customs which had become habits of the Jewish people. It can happen. The example I, I would use is as simple as the clothes we wear to church. Uh, you might not be surprised to know that I've been going to church my whole life. Uh, my mom always made sure, and it's not like we were rolling in dough, but she made sure we had church clothes to wear. And, um, you know, you had church pants, and it was especially... Some, most of the time we had a sports coat to wear. At first we had clip-on ties, and then we were very proud to know how to tie our own ties and go to church. Okay, so when I think about going to church, how do you think I pick out my clothes? I'm not really great at picking out clothes. So I get out my church pants and a church shirt, and I don't always wear a tie. I guess I wear a polo shirt sometimes now. Then I don't wear a sports coat. And uh, it's, it's just, it doesn't make me better, it's just the way I grew up. So a couple weeks ago I went to church with a gentleman who wore blue jeans that were pretty faded. And, and a shirt that, I don't know how he picked it out to go to church, but uh, there's quite a bit of difference between the two of us. And um, should that difference mean anything? Well, certainly not, especially if we're going to communion and we are united in the peace that we have with God in our Lord Jesus Christ as he is giving us his body and blood. The essence of our lives and our relationship with God is peace in the forgiveness of sins that Jesus earned for us on the cross. And, uh, Paul does such a nice job, since he was a Jew, that he understood all those Jewish customs. And being a, a call apostle and, and being given visions and revelations about our Lord Jesus, he can tell us that when Jesus died on the cross, uh, he was destroying the wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles. And he was destroying a wall of hostility with his body on the cross and the sacrifice he made there for sin. Now this was uh, demonstrated at the temple courtyard uh, by a sign. And I'm not going to get this exact, but the sign said, Whoever is not of the nation of Israel and crosses into this courtyard brings upon himself the death that he deserves. Well, that's, that's certainly a, a point of separation and that, that would divide people. And Jesus destroyed 
the rule that God gave that Gentiles were not allowed to go into that courtyard. But Jesus ended that because when he died on the cross, he said, it is finished. And he not only paid for your sins and my sins, he assured uh, his Old Testament people that the law, the Old Testament laws were fulfilled. He fulfilled it. He finished it uh, with his sacrifice on the cross. And of course, that's demonstrated for us when the temple, uh, the curtain in the temple ripped. Uh, that was a thick curtain. I, I don't know much about such heavy woven cloth, but it always made me wonder if two guys like me could even pull on it and rip it. It, it was thick. And it was ripped from top to bottom where no humans could reach it to tear it. God is the one who announced the, all the separation between a sinful man and himself as abolished. And it was abolished by the sacrifice of Jesus, the shedding of his blood on the cross. That's what we have in common. That's what unites us to Jesus. God, Jesus, our Savior, and, and that's what unites us as individuals, because we share Jesus as our Savior. Uh, and that's a kind of unity that uh, we would never have thought of if it wasn't told to us in the Bible. Do people talk about it when they talk about unity? Uh, you don't hear it outside of a Christian sermon, do you? This unity is profound. Uh, just, and just as you and I would never have dreamt that God knew us from eternity to bless us with his grace and salvation, uh, so we wouldn't understand that, as he said, that in, in Jesus the whole building is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together into a whole, into a dwelling place for God by the Holy Spirit. Uh, so, to unite us, to assure Gentile or Jews that they were united with God, even though the laws that were given to them showed them that they had fallen short, and to assure Gentiles that we have peace with God. Um, we are, uh, we are told that we are fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. And you have been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. Uh, our lives are built on the testimony of God's word, and we do that over time. You're here this morning uh, not because this morning you're going to receive all you're going to need for the rest of your life, uh, we can't put that in one sermon, can we? Uh, we come again and again to have our lives built on God's Word, the Old Testament and the New Testament, which both point to Jesus, and He is the cornerstone. Uh, God's salvation in the Savior is the cornerstone of Scripture on which all the testimony of the prophets and apostles uh, stem from and, and go straight from. We have our place uh, in this temple. We are alive and living, and we are built up to the glory of God, the place where God dwells in his temple. What a privilege. What a place to be. Who would imagine that we could occupy this status and this place. And as we look at that unity, uh, it reminds us that there are other people outside of Lutheranism, outside of the Wisconsin Synod, who also hold unswervingly to Jesus as their hope of heaven. Now, I firmly uh, uphold the teaching of fellowship in our circles because it's all based on the truth of God's Word. And we want to uphold the truth of God's Word. But we also know that God works powerfully through His Word to overcome uh, false teaching, 
and to bring into people's hearts of other denominations a true faith in Him. And so we have this uh, temple, this vision of a living temple <coughs> built up to God's glory of, of all believers. And so we rejoice in the faith in God wherever we find it, as well as struggle to uphold the truth of God's word against the false teaching where we find it too. So we have this blessing of being united. Being united how? Because Jesus is our peace. Now, the, the teaching of reconciliation to God through the blood of our Lord Jesus on the cross. The message of the Old Testament prophets very clearly given to us. And the message of the gospel in the New Testament. May we hold on to the truth of our peace with God and grow in being united in peace with one another. Amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Um, well, now I'll continue by confessing our Christian faith by uh, using the Apostles' Creed as it's found on page 41 in the hymnal. And we confess, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dark. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for the offering.
keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations, that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. before you in the name of Jesus our Lord and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. We give ourselves to you that we may serve you in whatever way.
We thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.